right. We usually start at 6.32 Pacific time and it just hit. So welcome to Slugs and Steins lectures from UC Santa Cruz. My name is April Yi, and I am part of the UCSC Alumni Council and one of your volunteer organizers tonight. With me is Mike Reapy, past president of the UCSC Alumni Council and Shana Kent with the Alumni Relations Office. Like last month, the organizers will stay on the screen during the talk so that our speaker doesn't feel like he's alone in the room. And for those who are new, our Slugs and Signs series engages a UC Santa Cruz faculty member in discussion with you, the local community of the Monterey Bay and Silicon Valley, as well as our extended family online, our extended community online, with the goal of making us all Renaissance people. And we want it to feel just like you're at UC Santa Cruz sitting in class, but with a drink in your hand and without tests. So before we get started, and since we can't see you, we'd like to know where you're zooming in from and how many people are watching. So there's a poll um, that you can fill out and we'll share the results after we've given everyone a moment to respond. All right, we can close the poll and show the results. Okay, so you'll be able to see the results now and looks like most people are from Santa Cruz County and the Bay Area, as well as other regions in California. No one said they're zooming in from outer space. Sometimes someone says that and looks like one person outside of the US too. All right. So tonight we'll be tipping our steins with Garth Illingworth, Distinguished Professor Emer Emeritus of Astronomy at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Between 1987 and 1992, Garth Illingworth led work on the Next Generation Space Telescope that is now known as the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST, or Webb for short. While Deputy Director of the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, he helped initiate a large eight meter class passively cooled infrared space telescope. After moving to UCSC and the Lick Observatory, he chaired the UV optical in space panel of the 1990 Decadal survey that recommended a six meter passively cooled large infrared space telescope that ultimately became the JWST. He shepherded the project through many aspects of its long development. And when he finally celebrated Webb's launch, on December 25th, 2021, he was the last original architect still involved. Garth has spent over two decades exploring with Hubble for the earliest galaxies in the first billion years of the universe and continues that work with JWST. Garth was a Miller Fellow at UC Berkeley and in 2010 was awarded an honorary Doctor of Science degree at the University of Western Australia. He is the recipient of the 2016 American Astronomical Society Lancelot M. Berkeley New York Community Trust Prize for his work on the most distant galaxies viewed with Hubble and was a plenary speaker for this award at the 2017 meeting of the American Astronomical Society. He was the 2018 Bacall lecturer giving a series of invited talks at the Space Telescope Science Institute NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. He is a fellow of the American Astronomical Society. And we'll have a detailed Q&A at the end, but Garth may take a few burning questions during the talk. So don't wait until the last minute. You can type your questions um, into the Q&A box at any time. And if you see someone else's question that you like, you can upvote it and we'll prioritize it and ask it sooner. And in a few days, you'll be able to find this lecture on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel. We'll post the link in our social media channels and follow-up emails as well. Okay, does everyone have their steins or for me, green juice? Um, great, well, I've got your slug, Professor Illingsworth. Good, thank you very much, April. I don't think I should be drinking my stein while I'm talking. <laughs> okay, so let me uh, share the screen here, get the right one. 
And there we can start on JWST comes to life and resets astronomy. And good evening, everybody. So this is great to be here. I'm would have been nice to have a few aliens call in to hear about web, but anyway, we'll uh, leave that for a later time. So what I really want to do is take you through various aspects of what it took to do web and then come back and we will look at some of the amazing science that's come out since the first uh, observations were released last July. So what I want to cover here is it'll be initially talking a little about launch and the and the um, lead up to that launch, but uh, about the activities that made web and set it up to actually do these amazing images. But then I'd like to go back in time and talk about how web came about and some of the milestones and challenges it faced. And then we'll go into looking at some of the results. And keep in mind that I always think of this as an origins telescope. It's telling us about our origins in the biggest way through to the earliest days of the universe. So origins is a theme which runs through this and through the science. So let me just give you a quick heads up on what this looks like. And it looks complicated, but in fact, we all have phones. And the camera in our phone is basically conceptually exactly the same as web. You have a little optical system, collects light, focuses it down on an electronic um, imager that converts that light into electrons and it's then processed digitally. It's just that this is a little bigger, like a thousand times bigger than a phone camera. And it runs a little colder, like at minus 400 degrees and it probably costs a little more than your average iPhone or Android phone these days. So this is basically a very simple optical system that collects light, focuses it down onto some cameras and instruments called spectrographs that spread that light out. So that's the sort of overview, but here's the reality of web. So on the left is the last time that uh, this telescope was opened up at Northrop Grumman on the ground in Los Angeles and at Redondo Beach in the clean room. And you can see how big it is when you look at some of the people, particularly the guy up on the distance. This is huge. And the sun shield is there. And I'll explain why that's there later. And then of course, on the right, it's all folded up because we have to fit it into a rocket fairing, which is quite small. One of the biggest ones that's available to us, but still small compared to Webb. So then once that was all folded up, we had to actually get it to the launch site. And the launch site is in Kourou in French Guiana because the Europeans were launching Webb on their largest rocket at the time, the Ariane 5. And so Webb was actually put into a environmentally sealed and controlled container on the back of this truck in the upper left. The guy driving this truck probably had it will never drive another load that's as expensive as this one. So here it is going through the Panama Canal on the Calibri. You see the, there's an interesting story here for security. This is $10 billion worth of investment. The actual path and so on was not announced, but people were very good at tracking the boat and finding out where it was and getting this video from the Panama Canal. So folks didn't know where it was at any one time. Then it finally arrived in French Guiana and then was taken into the launch area. And at that point, we were still a, a couple of months from launch because there was quite a lot to do. It had to be taken out of that container. It had to be checked out um, and made sure there was no problems from the shipping that electrically it worked. And then of course, it had to have some things done to it, like filling it with the propellant for the onboard little rockets that make sure that it can point and move and um, uh, remain in the orbit. And I'll talk about that a little more too. And these are quite um, dangerous chemicals. I think, you know, these are uh, rocket propellants. And so you can see the guys in these suits uh, setting up to fill web with the propellant. And then Webb was lifted up and put atop the rocket. This is the point where I get really nervous when I see our telescope hanging on one steel cable. 
And so I just hope they really tested that crane routinely. And of course, they always have every time they've picked it up. So here, Webb now is sitting on top of the rocket on the left with the fairing being brought over it. And the rocket itself is taken out of the vehicle assembly building and out to the launch site ready to go. And this was a couple of days before Christmas. So after negotiations with all the French unions, everybody agreed they would work Christmas morning to get Webb off. And the plan was to launch at 7.20 a.m. on Christmas Day, 2021. And uh, Wendy and I, my wife, were at, at Space Telescope Science Institute watching this uh, on a very large screen. We weren't in Kourou, not many people were, but mission control was there. And one of the things they gave us all was a whole bunch of cookies, which are like the mirrors with the key science goals on. And that was really nice. Good cookies, too. So at 7.20 a.m., exactly on the dot, Webb and the Ariane 5 launched and took off. And uh, the uh, manager, the launch manager in Kourou was uh, relaying the status updates. And there was an announcer also relaying. And every now and then, the uh, mission manager would say nominal and we would all go yay which is sort of sounds weird but in the space business when you do a launch nominal is the word that you really want to hear it means that everything is going exactly according to plan and so he would keep saying that and we'd all feel ah this is good so after several minutes um Webb was already now above the atmosphere uh, sorry Arian was above the atmosphere carrying Webb the uh, fairing was jettisoned, and then there was uh, another 20 or so minutes of uh, motion carrying Webb out into uh, space, ready to uh, set it on its way. And one of the things that Ariane Spars did for their rocket, which was just great, was to put a camera right on the upper stage that would show Webb leaving. This wasn't a camera that was planned. They, decided to do it for, especially for this rocket a year in advance, which is very short to do something and to make sure it all works. So it was put on there. And here is a picture of Webb 10 seconds after it was released. But I'm gonna show you a video which has some interesting aspects. So here is a little video from this camera. And uh, it was uh, processed and shows the separation. So it starts out, you actually see Webb before it leaves, right there. The camera is looking at Webb at the back end of Webb. And in a moment, you'll see suddenly it ejects. There are big springs that push Webb away from the rocket, very carefully, but very precisely. So at this point, Webb is now drifting away from the rocket, pushed by the initial impetus from the springs. And the very first thing that has to be done on Webb is for the solar panels to come out. Webb has batteries and the batteries can only power it for a number of hours. And if we don't get the solar panels out quickly, within six minutes was actually the requirement, then Webb would probably die if the batteries ran out. So this was a crucial moment, but we thought, well, six minutes, we're not gonna be able to see anything happen here. Maybe we'll be lucky and it will because it was controlled by the onboard co computer systems and was not controlled from the ground because it was just one of those very important steps. So we were all watching this thing. Oh, it's great to see it go. Nice picture of the earth on the upper right there. And but, you know, we probably won't see anything. And we we're all sitting here still watching and thinking, oh, well, it looks like it. And then suddenly the panels came out after less than about a minute. And we were all looking at ourselves in the room of Space Telescope going, what's going on here? And uh, the announcer at uh, admission control was going, huh, this seems a bit early. And so there was a, it took a, a while to sort this out. I saw the system engineer for the whole project immediately after this, after the launch and said to him, what happened? And he said, beats me. <laughs> so it turned out it took a little time to realize that what Ariane had done with their rocket was to so precisely point and eject Webb towards the, the place that you know we wanted it to go towards L2 and in the right orientation that the onboard software just said, huh, I'm fine. I can uh, release the panels now. So this was the first instance where we realized Ariane Spass had done an amazing job with the launch. 
So now we started on a really challenging period. So we had this folded up web, as you see on the upper left there, and we now had to deploy everything in space and everything was crucial. We had, everything had to work here or web would have become space junk basically. So for 15 days, so when the Mars mission landed, everybody was talking about minutes of, or seconds of terror. We had 15 days of terror on and off. So the first thing you see is that the sun shield, the, the pallets, the arms that contain the sun shield open out. Then the sun shield starts to pull out. Then we separate the layers. Then the mirror, the secondary mirror unfolds, the panels unfold to the primary. And after 15 days, all the major deployments are done and they all worked. We had one moment where everybody was on, uh, worried about what was going on, but it turned out to be fine. So everything worked after 15 days. We weren't done then at that point because now every one of the mirror segments had to be positioned um, in its nominal position. And there are 132 actuators that did that. And if any one of those failed, our optical performance would have been severely, severely impacted as well. But that all went great too. And so after about 25 days, Webb was fully deployed in space. We had 50 major deployments. There were what were known as 280 potential single point failures. So any one of these parts of the control, the movement, the latches had not worked, we would have had a major problem with the observatory or probably lost it. There were a whole bunch of 178 non-explosive actuators with spring loaded that everyone had to work. They all worked. The mirror actuators worked. So we, this was a phenomenally successful deployment. So at that point, while we were deploying, we were going out beyond the moon and we had to position, get web out to this point called L2. It's a stable point for the Earth, Moon, Sun system. I'll show you a little video that shows that better in a moment. But it took about 30 days to get out there. And we had to get there extremely precisely. And we had the onboard thrusters that I mentioned earlier, the rocket motors, were actually being used twice to actually make sure that Webb was pointed exactly to get to this L2 point. And that worked incredibly well. And in fact, it worked far better than we expected. We had originally planned the amount of fuel to make sure that Webb had enough fuel to get to L2 and to be able to keep it in that orbit over at least five years. That was the requirement. And we were thinking we, if everything goes well, 10 years. It turned out that again, Ariane's Fast did such an amazing job on positioning and pointing with the right velocity and making sure that Webb was in the right orientation to go to L2, that we didn't have to use very much fuel to actually get it there. And so now we have over 20 years of propellant left on board. And so propellant will not be a life limiting factor for Webb, which is incredible because it would be great to have this telescope be working for 20 years or so. So Webb is now sitting out going around a point out near the sun and just to give you a sense uh, near beyond the earth moon system and moving around the sun with the earth but pointed away from the sun all the time and so this is what it looks like here it is going around that l2 point earth and moon going around with us as well or the whole system going around with us we go in and out of the plane of the orbit and you can see always pointed away and the reason for that is shown in this next slide. We have to have the telescope or the instruments incredibly cold to work in the infrared. Infrared is far to the red of where our eyes can see in the optical. And the instruments will only work and we will only get great data if everything remains incredibly cold. So what we had to do designing web was make sure that we could stop the sunlight hitting any of the telescope or the optics. And it is at that point, it becomes easy to get things cold because the universe is just an incredibly cold refrigerator. And so 
just sitting there. You don't need any cooling at all. There is one refrigerator on board for one instrument, small compared to what would be needed to cool it, but you don't need it. The universe cools our telescope. But what is crucial is that we stop the hot uh, radiation from the sun, the light from the sun impacting on any of the optical parts. And that's why we have this five layer sun shield. And as I say here, this is a sun shield with a million SPF. It reduces 200 kilowatts, typically what you might use for 10 large houses down to a fraction of a watt that gets through onto the other side. And so that is a small enough that the universe can keep everything cold. So that has all been working incredibly well. Now, once we got up there at L2 after the deployment, that's at like 30 days, we then had to get into all the precision, careful alignment and cross-checking and check out of everything. It's a very complex system. There are hundreds of activities here that had to be carried through, each one of which had a huge list of items that had to be measured, checked off, moved, whatever, and large numbers of steps. This took, again, nearly six months to actually accommodate all this, fine tuning the optics so we had exquisite images, making sure the instruments were all working, and then near the end to get the first science instruments. So we had a very long period where there was very little information coming out because the folks at the mission control and elsewhere were working to get everything tuned up and ready to go. So we, at the end of the six month period by late June, we knew that the optical performance of Webb was absolutely amazing. We had de-scoped the optical performance back in 2005 to save money from the original goal of being able to have it work incredibly well in the optical region. But the engineers, the builders were so conservative in all their testing, construction and activities. In fact, Webb almost turned out to be as good as we had originally wanted 20 years ago. The instruments are working exceedingly well. And in fact, Webb exceeds its requirements and even expectations in essentially every area. And this little schematic here just is a, a real time, relatively real time, showing what the temperatures are on web. And you can see in the hot side of where the sun is at the bottom left there, facing up onto the spacecraft and the sun shield. It's like room temperature and above hot day. But then on the other side, it's a little chilly. So a rather cold day there. And then the instruments are very cold. So everything is working extraordinarily well at that particular point. So I'm going to transition now to give you some background on what it actually took to do a mission like this. But I was wondering if there were any uh, questions, Mike, that might have come up. Thanks, Garth. And we, we have one sort of technical question. I think uh, uh, Richard is asking what kind of diffraction grading is used. So I don't know if now is a good time or if you're going to get into the details of the instrument. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the instrument. So we actually have a variety of ways of diffracting, spreading out the light. And we have prisms, we have prisms, and we have gratings in the, in the different instruments there. In fact, every instrument has some means of doing that. And some of them are, are simple prisms, others are prisms with grating combinations, and others are actually real gratings, which are, you know, real gratings. And so there are a number of different aspects of that. And that's one of the things that makes web incredibly powerful is that it can do the spectroscopy, the diagnostics far better than any other telescope we've had like Hubble or Spitzer. Okay, good. So let me now go on at this point and we can follow up if there's any follow-up questions later. So let me take you back 36 years. So projects start because people start pondering, what do we really want to do in the future? Normally, you don't do it 36 years in advance. But uh, this was a statement that captured my attention, and for a particular reason, because it came from the director. I was deputy director, and the, one morning the director came in and said, 
you guys need to start working on the next big mission. It will take a very long time. And I said, Ricardo, we're four years away or five years away from launch of Hubble. We're all working like crazy. We can't possibly spend time on the next big mission. And he said, yeah, yeah, right. But trust me, it will take a long time and you need to start now. And so uh, being the boss, I went sort of, yes, sir. <laughs> and so we collected a small group of people together and started thinking about in our spare time, but also engaging with all the scientists at the Space Telescope Science Institute and thinking to the future. It became sort of a, a coffee time item. You know, we've all been working like crazy on trying to get things, the details working for Hubble. So it was actually sort of a, a relief almost to be thinking about a bigger picture thing for the future, something we call the Next Generation Space Telescope. And we very rapidly settled on doing a very big, cold, in the infrared, something where Hubble couldn't work and wasn't going to work and put it a far away from Earth and start thinking about that. And so here is this organization that was set up at that point to work with Hubble. So a few hundred people at the Space Telescope Science Institute in the mid 1980s. And these are the, the folks that, uh, so there's the director, Riccardo Giacconi, who was a future Nobel Prize winner for his work on X-rays. He didn't really, wasn't very interested in infrared telescopes per se, because he was an X-ray astronomer and really liked the X-ray uh, and Hubble um, approaches, but he was very supportive and helpful. And then there were several of us who worked very closely together out of this group and a lot of great people there at that time who were really working to make Hubble the success that it's become. So what we were doing then was actually, as we think about it, we were trying to conceptualize what would come beyond Hubble before Hubble. We all knew that Hubble was gonna change the game, the dynamics, that it was gonna be so powerful that it was gonna discover and do a whole lot of new things. So it became an interesting question. How can you sort of go beyond something that you're still not sure what it's actually gonna discover itself? But anyway, we felt that we had to start and we started thinking about the uh, telescope, the instruments, the science, all those different aspects and working with NASA to get support. And we set up this conference in 1989. This was the first big conference on NGST. And at that time we were thinking an eight to 10 meter telescope would be just great to do, a lot bigger than Hubble. We knew that if we did that, we would have an astonishingly capable facility. As part also of the future thinking that goes on in the science community, the astronomy community, every 10 years, we do a decadal survey where we think about what we would like to do for the future. And the panel that was working on the space telescopes, one of the two, came up with this one, and which was basically our next generation space telescope, but in a smaller form. And we tried to cost it out and we came up with $2 billion. So we set this up before the committee that would make the final decision. They had other priorities and said, it's too early to do this. But you know, this is interesting, but too early. So NASA was still quite interested in this and supported some technology efforts through JPL. And we had a really good workshop in 1991. Again, we were focused on this large infrared telescope cooled by the universe, big eight foot, eight meter, 26 foot mirrors located far away from Earth. So at this point, Hubble had launched and had huge problems because it had an optical problem that had to be fixed. And so uh, attention really focused on recovering Hubble. And so little was done on this for a while, but when Hubble was recovered, the director at Space Telescope set up to take an image of a totally blank piece of sky. A lot of astronomers thought he was crazy, but his uh, vision was certainly realized when we saw this image, the first Hubble deep field, and the sky was just filled with galaxies. Galaxies that were like our Milky Way and others just all over the place. And the naysayers were certainly proved wrong on this 10 days was spent on doing this. By the way, Webb can do this in six or seven hours. Again, an example of just how dramatically powerful it is. So during the 1990s, there were some major studies, HST and beyond, 
um, then followed by uh, another study of different concepts. Fortunately, the NASA administrator was very supportive of this and really wanted to do a big telescope. And so encouraged the astronomers involved to really think big. And he wanted, he said in the end, eight meters, which made me very happy because that was the size I really thought we, would, we should be working with. So by 2000, the Astronomy Decadal Survey came around again and a, a new committee was set up and worked through and decided that this NGST was going to be its highest priority mission. And partly it was this science goal from the Hubble Deep Field that find the first galaxies. This really helped frame and excite people. So at the end of the decade, and NASA had done an initiation on NGST, the decadal survey top ranked an eight meter NGST with a cost said to be about $1 billion. This gave me some heartburn at the time because I knew we had come up with a much bigger number in 1990 for a smaller telescope. So I was worried about this. And as it turned out, this was prescient, but I wasn't the only one worried. So then what happened? Why did it take 22 years basically to get to launch? And why did it take so long? So unfortunately, <laughs> as you can imagine, slowly, painfully, and at great expense, I would say is a good summary of what happened over the next 20 years but with an astonishingly capable set of thousands of people involved in this across the nation in Europe and in Canada, our partners. And so now we were going through a period where it was extremely challenging. As I say, many rocky shoals on the path forward. Every year, the cost and schedule issues arose and we were stuck with budgetary challenges. Mike Griffin, was a new administrator that came in in 2005 and made the very prescient and clearly true statement, JWST was undercosted from the start. JWST was definitely undercosted. The budget had to be increased every year. There were problems that uh, were trying to be re uh, fixed and recovered from, but we were still facing challenges. So NASA had got to the point where it needed to go through a, one of its formal steps and it had approved it for fabrication in 2008 and said it should be able to be launched by 2014 for a total cost of $4 billion. But the con problems continued and the Office of Management and Budget, which is in the administration and oversees the budget for NASA and others and congressional support, was uh, people, folks were getting really worried. And so that support for web was waning. Barbara Mikulski, Senator from Maryland, had, was a very strong supporter of web and got our space flight center where this was based. She was hearing the comments and getting extremely worried as well about what could happen to web and wrote a fairly direct and fairly pointed letter Actually, I mean, she requested that NASA set up an independent review committee and had written that to uh, administ NASA Administrator Bolden. And uh, when Senator Mikulski made a request like that, uh, it was more than a request. And, Senator and Administrator Bolden took it to heart and set up a, a, a committee with uh, a, some extremely experienced people under Chair John Cassani from JPL. And we went through a several months, very detailed, well, actually it was like a month and a half, but then another month putting it, the report together. Quite short, actually, given that we had to come up and identify what the problems were and give some sense of what could be done to get out of the box that JWST was in. So one of the first things that we did was we had to identify what went wrong. Well, it's clear the initial budget was just too low. I think all of those of us who felt that in 2000 were really justified in, in saying that, but there are a lot of political aspects drove that. Every year, though, because the budget was low and a lot of work was needing to be done, there weren't enough reserves to deal with problems. They were still developing new technologies. And so what they were doing 
was deferring work and this invariably drove up the cost of the mission so they needed yet more money so we actually sat down and not me per se but the project managers who had the experience on this committee and estimated that um, it was going to take at least two more years and the budget would have to be increased by one and a half to two billion dollars to launch it but the Independent Review Comprehensive Review Committee asked NASA to do a bottoms-up rebudgeting exercise. It, we NASA really needed to understand what it was actually going to take to do this. Of course, the fact that we were increasing the cost by fifty percent and significantly delaying the mission made the Office of Management and Budget and Congress very unhappy. But to NASA's credit, NASA stepped up to the plate and agreed to do a very thorough bottoms up replan. And that was led by Rick Howard, the program director for JWST at this time at NASA headquarters working with the project. And what they came up with in spring was a launch in October, 2018 for a construction cost of $8 billion. And for what would need a yearly budget of nearly 600 or roughly $600 million every year. This was a huge increase. And so again, the Office of Management and Budget and Congress were even unhappier than before. So this was in spring of 2011. The congressional budget, the appropriations committees were talking about this. And the, on the House side, we got killed. Chairman Frank Wolf of the House Appropriations Committee. I heard about this uh, on July 6th that it could happen on July 7. They voted and said this bill also terminates funding for the James Webb Space Telescope, which is billions of dollars over budget and plagued by poor management. This was a real shock. Not totally unexpected, but a real shock in that given the investment and the time and the effort and the potential of web. Fortunately, so a huge effort was launched by a lot of people. Um, we were lucky to have Nobel laureates, a lot of physicists, physics societies, societies and astronomers supported continuing. Unfortunately, we did face senior astronomers actually getting into the media and saying it was time to kill JWST and to use the money for their projects or other projects. So this is a typical challenge that one faces in these situations. But fortunately, what struck us was that we had amazing public support. You know, this was years before web was launched, but I think because Hubble had become part of the culture and then web had been talked about as the next big thing taking us forward, there was a huge amount of public interest in web. And I was astonished to get an email from a teacher in Kansas asking me how they, she and her class could help. And so this was just around the country in so many different ways. So fortunately, this got back to Congress. Chairman Wolf was seeing a lot of support for JWST. Senator Mikulski was working to try and support it. And so finally, agreement was re re reached in a conference committee in November of 2011. And uh, JWST was brought back to life, but under, with very strongly worded constraints with a cap and uh, a launch date. And in the upper left, that's Barbara Mikulski with Chris Galise, the NASA uh, Associate Administrator earlier, and then the uh, Director at Goddard Space Flight Center. He was a great supporter of Webb and did a lot for that too. So Senator Mikulski was a, a huge help before she retired in 2016, I think. So then for the next five years or so, Webb was doing great. We finally got Congress and OMB to agree to give us the budget that was needed, to give us the reserves that were needed. And so at um, Goddard, the telescope and instruments were all being put together and tested. And in parallel, the warm parts, the sun shield and the spacecraft were being built out at Northrop Grumman in Los Angeles. Lots of good progress there. Here, the completed telescope and instruments were taken down to Johnson Space Center in Houston to a huge vacuum chamber. 
And the whole thing was put into this monstrous vacuum chamber that was originally from Apollo days and had to be refurbished to do web and verified that optically it worked. We didn't have another Hubble disaster in the making on our hands. You get a sense of the scale of this here when you see all the guys standing around. So it was cooled down to about its operational temperature. A lot of checking came through fine, even though the hurricane caused some real problems for the folks there. They had to camp out amidst the floodwaters and try and keep it all working and cold. So, that was going on, it was looking good. So now folks out at uh, Northrop uh, working this uh, sun shield and the spacecraft. And this is the sun shield material, this incredibly thin, aluminized, aluminum coated material. This is what makes up our sun shield that we had to deploy in space. Really flimsy, really tricky to actually deal with this. And so multiple tests were done with this, putting it all together, deploying it, making sure the mechanisms work, finding things which jammed up and didn't work properly and having to rebuild them. And so this is one of the cases where I was out with the program scientist from NASA headquarters, Eric Smith, who had been working on this project also since uh, the 90s. And so we were looking at the progress on the sun shield here and somewhat terrified by the number of mechanisms. So as I list here, there's a quarter of a mile of cables, 90 of them, 400 pulleys, 70 hinge assemblies, eight deployment motors, and 139 of these critical release mechanisms just to do the sun shield. So this is the part of the deployment that I can tell you made me most nervous when we were in space. So, what we had to do, of course, was to take our telescope, which had been down in Houston being tested. And so it came up to Northrop Grumman where all the integration was going to occur. Sitting at Northrop Grumman was the sun shield and the spacecraft, the warm part. So those had to be brought together. And then ultimately they would look like the little image on the left that you saw earlier. But you'll notice that I highlighted in red 2018 at the top, this, was 2018 and we were going to launch in November. Well, I wasn't so sure that uh, it was much uh, hope for actually doing that at that time. And uh, clearly, in fact, that was the case that we had already realized that we were never going to make the launch date. So there were some rough times again for Web. And so uh, there was uh, more funding was needed. The Office of Management and Budget was very unhappy that money was actually grudgingly given in the end because we were so close. And then we went through two years of great progress and we got to the point where we launched, which I started out with basically earlier. It was just amazingly good period. Once everything started to come together with NASA and the Northrop Grumman folks teaming out there. So now we're into revealing our first science images. Uh, April, did you want to put up the other little poll? Oh, yeah. Um, I'll have Diana help with that. Okay, sure. Yeah, thank you. So I was going to now talk through some of the science, but I was also interested before I get into that, what uh, folks thought about the science and what most interested them. I'm not going to respond to this in real time, but it'll be interesting to see what you think about the science and which areas you think are most interesting to you personally. We'll just give it a couple more seconds. Yep, then... that's fine. Yep, I want to make sure that folks get an opportunity because I'm going to now start walking through pretty much and showing you some examples of all these things. And uh, it, and how just amazing web is on returning new information, novel new results from uh, science, from things that we had hoped it would do, and it is doing incredibly well. Yeah, so it looks like people are most interested in finding the first galaxies in our universe 13 billion years ago. Okay, good. Yeah, but interesting distribution. That's good. Okay, good. Well, let me now. We'll want to take a few through, questions, uh, uh, questions about the construction and deployment? Oh, sure. Uh, is there something that everybody, you... if you want to go in and upvote, uh, you want to 
take the first one, April. Sure. Um, what were you most worried about in the deployment? And it sounds like you answered that question about the sun. <laughs> yeah, I'll answer it again, though. So, you know, every one of them was sort of one of those heart stopping moments when we initiated the commanding to do it. But the sun shield, I knew the sun shield was the, in many ways the most demanding. There were so many mechanisms. It was floppy material. You had to unravel it and pull it apart. And there were just so many things there. So that whole period was, I think, where I was most on tenderhooks about uh, web and its future. And so definitely the sun shield. But, uh, and after that, it was a little less so, but unfortunately, well, fortunately, whatever, everything had to work to make a working telescope. So you, the next day or a couple of days later, something else would start moving and I'd still already still be nervous again. Okay, and I'll ask one more and then we'll hold the rest uh, to the end. We have a lot of amazing questions coming in. Uh, with, with eight upvotes, a question from Jim Daly. Can you talk about some of the material science innovations your team created? <clears throat> yeah, so I think there were a number of technologies which we had to push. I mean, the, certainly the sun shield and its material and the use of sort of uh, floppy thin material in a space environment was all new. The um, infrared um, detectors and sensors were partially new, but very specific requirements uh, fell to web. Um, we have a cryo cooler on board, which cools down to five degrees or so above absolute zero. That is extraordinarily challenging technology. So there are a number of technologies here which were uniquely developed or developed, you know, incrementally, but challengingly. Everything that we did on web was um, a challenge and it, it was just, it was largely one-off capabilities. Nobody else has built anything like this before. The conceptual deployments, yes, people, have, folks have done that in space, but nothing like web. So there were, you know, a whole number of beryllium mirrors, um, the precision of the actuators, there are amazing actuators in there that can move millimeters and yet move nanometers so have a dynamic range of you know well over a billion this is astonishing so well not well over a billion but anyway approaching that so this, these are astonishing capabilities okay okay so i'll go on and we'll come back to other questions later so by the end of um, June, everything was uh, set up and Webb was uh, actually collecting some data through the Mission Control Center, which is in Baltimore Space Telescope Science Institute. And a big event was set up on July 12, where the very first observations were going to be repaired, uh, going to be revealed to the public nationwide, worldwide. NASA loves to do this. And of course, you know, it's, it's crucial that we get the visibility and show that the investment has been worth it. Interestingly, we were sitting in the auditorium here, Wendy and I were sitting there, and I realized that this is exactly the same auditorium where we held the first NGC, NGST workshop 33 years ago at that time in 1989. It looked very similar. I mean, there's some different electronics and projection capabilities, but it's basically the same seats in this auditorium. It was quite remarkable, deja vu moment. So this was the first image. This was actually shown the previous night at the White House and revealed there. But uh, this was the first one that came up and the assembled folks there went, ah, oh, this is amazing. And this is a cluster of galaxies. This is a picture of the universe like that Hubble Deep Field, but through this cluster of galaxies. And so to give you a sense, this is a Milky Way-like galaxy. You can see that this is Milky Way is nothing extraordinary when you compare it to what you see here and is smaller than a lot of galaxies. So this was an astonishing image to actually do. And the reasons why it was so powerful and to folks, especially the astronomers, was this is the deepest infrared image that's ever been taken. It was only 12 hours on web and yet it was as deep as hundreds of hours on Hubble. And it immediately showed to 
those folks who had known work with galaxies that the goal of finding the first galaxies was not was sort of within reach that we're getting that understanding was possible from these sort of capabilities you can't really see them here but the tiniest little red dots in this actually we're looking back through 13 billion years and seeing the light that's traveled across the universe for 13 billion years and this is close to the beginning of time the big bang was only uh was 13.8 billion years ago so even with this initial image, we have some examples of looking back through about 95% of all time. So I think what I would like to do is just walk through some of the different science goals and show you, you know, just how JWST is starting to help us explore about our origins, about galaxies, about stars, about planets, about how galaxies have built up over time. So one of the things that has been on our plate, as it were, for 20 years is a list of science goals. We always had talked very early about observing the universe's first galaxies. We wanted to understand about how galaxies grew over time into the Milky Way we live in today, for example. We want to be able to reveal how stars are born and how the planets around them are born as well. And then, of course, we would love to understand about uh, and find exoplanets and see what their potential for life is. But of course, on top of all this, we always keep in mind that when you have a capability like this, that's so immensely powerful, you're, going to, you're embarking on a voyage of discovery. Things will come out of the data that you had not expected at all. So this is the framework in which we started out on this. And we've been looking at uh, the data coming in from where and to start out and go through some of these, for example, the birth of stars and galaxies. This is a nebula in our galaxy. <clears throat> and this was one of the first images shown, and it is just astonishing. This is a huge dusty region, many large, dozens of light years across with lots of gas, lots of dust, lots of bright stars, the blue streamers, uh, gas and dust has been heated by bright young stars and is streaming out hidden in here and not so hidden are little dark regions which contain stars and planets that are now forming. So this gets to the heart of being able to look and try and understand more about what's how stars and planets actually form. And of course, there's this amazing pillars of creation image. The first one of these was taken back with Hubble in 94 and then updated in 2014. 94, anyway, in about that time frame. But of course, it was immediately one of the ones that we wanted to look at was Webb. And the reason is that Webb can help see through all the dust. You go to the infrared and we can peel away the layers of dust and see a lot of the stars inside. And this is just an eerie, eerie image. And here is another example with one of the cameras on Webb on the left and the other camera, the Miri camera, the longer wavelength camera, on the right, and it's just an astonishing amount of detail. So visually, this is striking, but it also is scientifically incredibly valuable. That, and the results from this are still gonna be coming out for a long time with images like this and doing the spectroscopy. So the other area, of course, exoplanets, I wanted to touch on that as well, and what we can learn about planets around stars nearby stars. One of the things that we really would like to do is to be able to look directly at planets around the nearby stars and measure their characteristics. It's extraordinarily difficult. You know, our, to see a planet like our uh, Earth around a nearby star, a similar star to the sun, we have to reduce the light of the star in the telescope, in the instrumentation by something approaching 10 billion times. This is extraordinarily difficult. Webb is not set up to do this. A whole new telescope is needed to do that well. But Webb can do what is called coronography, where you block the light from the star and you see the image of a planet. And this is several views with different cameras and different filters from Webb. The funny structure in the ones on the lower left is due to the nature of the light blocking uh, system that's used. So these are images of planets. This is a bright one. 
that uh, has actually been seen from the ground, but it's, it was a demonstration uh, that Webb can block the light and will be able to do some work on planets around nearby stars, <clears throat> though limited compared to what ultimately we would like to be able to do. But this is, Webb can do more and it can do this. And this is amazingly powerful. This was demonstrated with Hubble and with uh, Spitzer Space Telescope. If you have a planet, where a system which is oriented such that the planet moves in front of the star and you measure the light as over time, and you will see that as the planet goes in front of the star, it blocks a little bit of the light from the star. So in this case, and this is sort of a good one, it's a percent or so, the most is going to be probably a couple of percent and, low, and everything else is really small. But it turns out we have such precision instruments that we can take the light from the star plus the planet in this situation, subtract off the star, and then see what it tells us about the atmosphere of the star. This is a very challenging set of observations, but folks are now doing this. And one of the things that we can do by then spreading the light out that has been subtracted and just as the planet light is see what molecules might be revealing themselves. And in this particular case, in this hot planet, you can see there's carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, various molecules, sodium as well. So there's a variety of things which get revealed as a result of these sort of observations and a lot remains to be learned here. And so Webb will be able to do this and will be able to tell us a lot. So exoplanets is going to be a, a powerful, uh, web is going to be a powerful source of being able to see and try and decipher certain classes of exoplanets, probably not Earth-like ones. So that's a, a, challenge, a challenge beyond web in all likelihood. So of course, we can come to our solar system and another way to try and understand planetary systems is to look at our planets in our own solar system. And this is Jupiter. It is an amazing image. That is the great red spot, which here is blue, but that is uh, bigger than the Earth. So it's a huge spot there and extremely faint rings there that show up in these images uh, from Webb, which are very hard to see any other way. So solar system as well is a great opportunity for Webb. So another one of the major activities that were listed as the goals is trying to understand the buildup of galaxies over time. And interestingly, this is the image we saw earlier where I said, you know, we're finding little objects near the beginning of time, but it also, an image like this is a history book of galaxies over nearly all time. So we're looking back through 13 billion years here, but there are galaxies here that uh, a few billion years ago. And so we can see galaxies in here and map how galaxies change and grow in these images over most of the life of the universe. So these are incredibly powerful, not only for the very earliest galaxies, but also for seeing how galaxies like our Milky Way will grow. But of course, then we can take images of galaxies close to us and each of these galaxies is sort of a, about as luminous or as bright as the Milky Way, but different in many ways. So this is called Stefan's Quintet. It's actually a quartet because the one on the left, the upper left there is actually much closer to us. It's just a, an interloper in front of the other galaxies. But these galaxies are astonishing because these are interacting. The ones in the middle, the two close pairs are tearing each other apart as they come together. And so when they do that, they form a lot of stars. And this gives us some incredible insights into what happens during these mergers, we call them, or interactions, where galaxies basically do this car wreck. And, but you also then, the galaxy rebuilds as part of that and grows anew with many more stars. What was amusing here was that we did not know this, but in the galaxy at the top, there's actually a giant black hole in the center and it was hidden by dust. And so it was revealed in the web images. So there's so much going on and being learned at the moment. And this is one of those first spectacular images as well. Now, so let me talk about the 
the goal that Webb had, which was uh, really to try and understand the very first and find the first galaxies. And this was uh, something that really captured the attention. Within four days of the data being released, two papers had been written, the data had been processed, and papers written and put on the web finding galaxies at earlier times beyond what or closer to the Big Bang than Hubble ever found. And so these are those two galaxies a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, looking back through 97% of all time. And so the excitement of Hubble just captivated and led to a huge amount of competitive work, a lot of fun pretty tiring, but just an amazing amount of fun doing this and finding something really new. And in fact, we've also confirmed that the most distant galaxy ever seen by Hubble in back in 2010, it was first discovered, is actually a real galaxy with, a, and it learned more about it as well. And so we have followed up with that also. This is another example too, that on the right is Webb and on the left is Hubble. And one fourteenth the time Webb is going at this pretty much the same depth as Hubble. So what we are seeing, I'm just gonna sort of end, this is a bit wordy, but I'm gonna just say, this is one of the enigmas that we're dealing with at the moment. We are seeing something very unexpected very early on. The galaxies from the first 400 to 500 million years after the Big Bang, there's, more of them than we expected. They appear to be much brighter than we expected. And we do not really understand yet what we're seeing. And so that's one of the great puzzles. So already within months, Webb has unearthed a real interesting puzzle for what is happening at the earliest times as galaxies. And we're gonna be working on those, I, that aspect for some time now to try and understand and to see if our models, our concept of what was being developed was wrong. So just let me wrap it up at this point. There are already a huge number of papers and uh, presentations on web that are out there with uh, you know just new records, new information that is coming in from web. And so it's doing what we hope, it's taking us through and exploring our origins from the first stars and galaxies to nearby planets to our solar system, everything in between. So I'd like to wrap it up at that point and say thank you very much for watching and following and being interested in web and astronomy. And I will put up a, a, a little slide here too for folks to look at as well. If you're interested in supporting astronomy at UCSC, and there are a number of different ways that one can do that. Okay, so thank you. Wow. <laughs> I think, April, you have the next question. Oh, sure. Well, thank you so much, um, Professor Ellingworth. That was, I mean, I learned a lot about web and um, well, the next question says, well, uh, by Val, um, says, will NASA JSW, JWST will be able to capture any of the value in public investment in technologies like the SunShield that were developed with public funds are part of this investment to be, in re to be reinvested in future NASA projects? Yeah, I, I think, you know, that we may not use exactly the same technology uh, in some cases we will, but I suspect that, you know, this is the capabilities that are developed, you know, become part of the baseline. And this is not at really at NASA. There are hundreds of companies around the country that have been involved in developing different aspects of web. And to do that, you know, they were funded, they were given the support and they work with uh, big contractors like Northrop and so on to do this. And so that base of expertise has grown as a result of this. And so even if a particular technology is not used, that capability, the training that's come about because of that or the experience is there as a reservoir for future activities as well. So I think there will be direct benefits in certain areas and particularly 
aspects of web are now being thought about that might play into, for example, using segmented mirrors with a precision control will almost certainly be used in the next big telescope that NASA does. It'll be a different telescope. It'll be focused much more on looking for planets, but those sort of technologies and capabilities will help underpin that and enable that and give confidence that we can do a telescope like that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll just remind everybody, right? We have a lot of questions coming in. You can you can upvote them. Uh, we still have a lot of questions about the first part of the talk about uh, building and, and shepherding the telescope through Congress, right? Uh, we have questions about uh, about the science as well. Uh, start thinking about those. Um, next question is from uh, Dan Chen. Um, I think Dan has heard information that one of the mirrors was damaged. Is that true? Yes, so we always knew that uh, Webb was going to get bombarded by micrometeoroids out there. And we had taken the experience from other missions in space and calculated that Webb would get whacked by a tiny little particle about every month, which would essentially do no damage. And then about once every five years, it would get a, a bigger one that would actually could potentially damage the mirror or something. And so what was interesting was in May during commissioning, one of the mirrors got whacked by a big particle and we're all sitting around going, oh dear, this is not good. Did we misestimate the micrometeoroid heavy energetic particle rate? And so the little ones have been continuing to hit it about the same once every month or a little more. And so that was right. And we haven't had another big hit. So I think it was just unfortunate statistics. So it hit the mirror. It damaged the mirror. Luckily, we can correct the shape of the mirror a little bit. And we did that. The, the engineers did that. And the end result is that Webb's optical performance is degraded very slightly, but it's still hugely better than we had planned for in orbit. So we're still in great shape. But we are wondering just what the frequency of these events is like. If they turn out to be more often than five years, then you know Webb will degrade more quickly. If it's sort of once every five years, we'll be where we expect it. And so there'll be degradation over time. We know that. Um, but we're all sort of hoping, okay, this was just a strange one-off that happened in four months instead of five years, you know, single event statistics, <laughs> black swans. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, and people are really interested in the sunshield material since you talked about it a little bit. Um, for the sunshield material, where, how do you go about creating this type of fabric? Is it woven? Is it like a plastic sheet, but out of special materials? Who can create something so big in one piece? Yeah, so it's actually a capped on material. It's a, it's a very well known, well used uh, thin material that's used for bases, very tough. And in this particular, so it's sort of like the thickness of a, a human hair, actually, but sort of a little thin sheet of paper. So very thin, but it's a very tough material. It's coated with aluminum to make sure it reflects the heat energy. And on the two, on the hottest ones, it also has a silicon overcoating as well. Um, so yeah, it's a relatively standard material. And I know, you know, when if you every now and again you try and unwrap something, you buy at Costco, and it, it's like, yeah, when, why does this come apart? So plastic materials, even very thin, can be very tough, and kept on is definitely one of those. <laughs> I like the Costco analogy. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've all been there. <laughs> um, question from Theodore. Uh, what is, uh, is already anticipating the next telescope? What is the next gen space telescope after Webb? And what are the odds it will be built? Uh, what are the odds it will find ET life? Uh, and I think maybe there was a question from Kaku. Is Kaku right? Uh, uh, <laughs> we should co not contact them, I guess. And <laughs> something uh, and about string theory. Is string theory likely to be proven by the Webb and NSG? So way to get three questions in there, Theodore. <laughs> OK. so. The next telescope is already under construction. It is much more a Hubble-like telescope, the same size, very similar mirror. 
and it's designed to take images over a huge field. So that will be launched later in the decade. Um, and so that is much more taking images and but not aimed at a particular science problem like the exoplanets. It's it's a very general purpose telescope, probably with some focus on dark energy. It can do work on particular styles of exoplanets. But the one that is most likely to make a huge difference to our understanding of exoplanets is called the Habitable Worlds Observatory. And it is only just conceptually starting. We know sort of roughly what it'll be like a web sized or hopefully in my view, a little bigger, but uh, one that's designed specifically, specifically to do, to measure these immense, really faint objects near very bright stars. So that's, you'll hear more about that, but that's probably, I've, you know, and given experience 20 years away. <laughs> So Roman Space Telescope is five or six years away. Um, and the, the uh, you know, whatever string theory aspect, this is extraordinarily challenging. And the cosmology aspects may be better answered by what's going to be done with Roman, but um, particularly with investigating dark energy. But this is a problem that requires so many, you know, sort of different approaches and trying to pierce together just little bits of information that we get very, with a lot of challenges and painfully. Cosmology is tough. We, you know, we've established pretty well what the universe is like, but the details are eluding us at the moment. And uh, there are some enigmas there that folks are really pondering and wondering whether it's, we understand as well as we think. So. That work will continue, but in many different ways. Web will contribute, but will not be a, you know, the only player in this game. Great, thank you. Um, Douglas asks, if early bright galaxies cannot be explained so far, are there thoughts to revise or update the Big Bang theory? No, I think at this stage, we don't need to change our view of cosmology. This certainly came up. We found these galaxies, they're very bright, they appear to be more massive than they should be. We, we that they could build up in the time available, and so one of the questions was asked: Did we have our cosmology wrong? I think that's a huge leap. I think there are other things that could be happening with these galaxies, like the stars that are in them that are different to what we see in galaxies now, and so that they're not as massive as we think. So there's a lot of things that we need to do. I think on the galaxies themselves before we go, well, it looks like we have a problem with the cosmology. So, but you know, it's always fun to, and folks like this, they, you know, will jump to thinking about the implications. Uh, you know, if if they're, everything turns out that they are massive at very early times, what impact does this have on our thoughts about how the cosmology is like? Do we need to change it there? I don't think the Big Bang not won't go away per se. I think that's extraordinarily well established from all the microwave background experiments and work that's been done over the last few decades. But um, the details could change if we run into a real problem explaining these big galaxies or bright galaxies. So I think stay tuned, you know, it's a work in progress. <laughs> Okay, we have a, a question from from Barbie, maybe a sensitive question, right? Um, she's she's asking about maybe uh, you know the the reaction by Congress and the OMB. I mean, I would say I'm, I'm running some numbers, right? You you spent about eight and a half billion dollars on this, and it looks back about thirteen billion years. So that's really less than a dollar per year. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Deep to me, but. Um, Barbie, Barbie's asking about, um, you know, is, is the, maybe is the impression still that JWST is or was haunted by poor management, right? I mean, it's very difficult to plan something for 20 years. Is that maybe in your view, a sign of poor management, a sign of poor planning, or just how big science happens? Right? And, yeah, so I think the biggest issue here was starting out with the wrong budget and too low. And so it, one of the lessons we learned from that, for the, you know, I mentioned the decadal survey in 1990 and 2000. I chaired a national committee for four or five years in the middle of the 2000s. And every year I had to write a report to Congress and 
uh, OMB and so on. And we said, we must more accurately cost these missions. And so when 2010 came around, the community, NASA, everybody was on board with being more realistic about the cost. And so at that point, I think that we had started and embarked on doing this better. And so it wasn't a management issue. It was just, you know, when you start so far away from where you need to be with the funds available and you told people you can do it, et cetera, that recovery is just awfully challenging. So it's a political challenge. The project itself, the project managers and people working it did the best they could and did very well. Um, but, you know, unfortunately in 2010, after the ICRP report, the project manager was fired. You know, there's sort of a feeling somebody has to take the blame, but I and others felt that, you know, that we understood the political necessity, but the reality was that the root cause of all this really went back to 2000 when we just started with the wrong budget. So for the new one, the, I mentioned Habitable Worlds Observatory. In the new 2020 decadal survey, they were clear. They thought it was going to cost $11 billion and said so. So that is the right way to do it. We may not convince anybody that we should be doing it for $11 billion, but at least we will start where we need to start. So we have made progress on that. But all in all, I think the management of these projects has been very good. There have been problems, there have been mistakes made, but these are immensely complicated and challenging projects. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mark asks, why was gold selected for the mirror coating? Ah, because it reflects infrared light extremely well. <laughs> so, and it doesn't have to work in the uh, blue. So if it was going to be a telescope for working where like Hubble, then we'd have to use something else. But gold is just perfect for the infrared. And mm -hmm. so and it's not much, it's just really thin layer of gold sitting over the beryllium mirrors. Mm. <laughs> Maybe I'll jump. There's a question from Art, a little bit out of order, but uh, why are the mirrors made of beryllium? It's tricky um, to deal with. Yeah, the, this is fascinating. It was a competition between a couple of the companies early on, whether it would be a special glass or it would be beryllium. And the crucial thing is that we polish the mirrors and the segments at room temperature, but then we're going to dump them in space and have them operate at minus 400 degrees. So it better have very predictable characteristics between room temperature and minus 400 because you need to cool it down, measure it, and then bring it back up again and polish it and so on. You go doing this. So you, it's really a material that is known to be stable and stable over the range of temperatures at minus 400 because not all mirrors are at minus 400 exactly. You know, they range over about 15 degrees. And they can change a little as the telescope moves around. So it's the stability and the predictability, I would say. And it's lightweight too. It's a nasty material to work with, but it has these good advantages from a astronomy and telescope perspective or cold telescope perspective. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Stuart asks, are redundancies built into the 50 steps, et cetera, during launch? No, not at all. We, as much as possible, we like to have redundancies. In most areas, we have redundant electronics. We have redundant mechanisms. We can switch over. We can have redundant motors. But in a deployable facility like this, it's just not possible to do that in all cases. So I said that there were 280 single point failures and they were really single point failures. Every one of those mechanisms, latches, release springs had to work. If it had jammed up and we couldn't move the sun shield, well, we were dead in the water as it were, or dead in space. <laughs> so they were why we were so nervous about each of the deployments. So uh, there was no redundancy. You know, we do it as much as possible, but there are, you reach a limit when you have a deployable system, things have to release. And so you can't have any hangouts. And so, yep, 280 of those. <laughs> but still, good engineering, very good testing, a lot of testing. 
Um, Robert Kibrick uh, obviously knows his mirrors. Um, can you comment on how the segmented mirror technology invented by Jerry Nelson and first deployed at Keck influenced the ev evolution of JWST? I think it was a, a, a demonstration that this approach could work. You know, before we built Keck and uh, had it actually work, you know, there've been lab tests done and so on, but there's nothing like getting a real telescope to work. And so when Keck One came online in the early nineties and everything worked, it was just, ah, this is, this is a technology we can use. So I think that helped. So it, it helped make sure that, you know, when people brought this up, there wasn't a rolling of eyes saying, oh, you'll never do it. Because you could always point to Keck and say, we have done it, it works. We're gonna do it differently. It's gonna be cold, it's gonna be beryllium or cold glass or whatever. But it, that demonstration was crucial, I think, to making this path forward a doable path in a conservative environment. We tend to be very conservative in space. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a question from Art. Um, do mo don't he says don't most all or all galaxies have a black hole at the center? Um, probably. <laughs> you know, there are ones where it's clear where they're emitting a huge amount of light and energy where there's a massive black hole. So I suspect that pretty much all big galaxies do, but you know, a lot of them, we can't see the effects of the black holes or measure it. So it then becomes a, a matter of you know, conjecture to some extent, but we see enough examples and we see good relations between the mass of black holes and the mass of galaxies. So you surmise that whatever it is that results in galaxy growth and the growth of a black hole that sort of goes together and we already are seeing the evidence for big black holes in galaxies at early times in the universe several five six seven hundred million years after the big bang so yep so i would say if it's a big galaxy it's very likely to have a black hole in the center but you may not be able to see it or measure it easily okay um now we're running close <laughs> to adding out of time we might just take Two or three more questions. Um, we do have some, just some comments. Um, uh, Joy says, just says thank you. Uh, and, uh, and Jana says, thank you for the talk and for your work. JWST is such a bright spot in a dark time for humanity. I think that really sums it up. I mean, it gives us something to hope. And Yes, and I, you know, this is something where, you know, in Congress and elsewhere, we've had support across both parties over many years and so on. So, and across, you know, the nation from sort of everywhere, you know, I heard us uh, got a our project manager got a letter from a, a you know a farmer in Idaho who was saying this is just amazing stuff. So yeah, this this is something that you know we can share in. Um, thank you. <clears throat> There's a question from Joe: Is there collaboration with scientists and engineers in China and Russia at all? Um, there is scientifically at sort of the individual level, there definitely is. Um, there, you know, the, the collaborations are now very difficult, of course, with Russia. And there's, you know, a lot of concern about collaborations with China also. So they're not the nations that, you know, I think we, NASA, the agencies are looking to for collaborations in the future. It's mostly a European, Japanese, Canadian, Australian, you know, a number of other places. But uh, yeah, the geopolitical situation sort of doesn't work in the favor of that, even though scientists at the individual level do keep in contact. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. We have a lot more compliments coming in. We'll think we'll take maybe two more questions. So get your, your final upvotes in. Uh, if this one's quick, maybe we can get to one more. Um, a question from Aviva. Uh, is perhaps the problem uh, with the assumption of a, of a smooth universe just after the Big Bang because it was hot? Uh, perhaps if what came out of the Big Bang was 
renormalizable as per QCD on a small scale. You'll have to explain this question to us, <laughs> but on what became larger scales as well. So uh -huh. things started off more like a big foam at many scales, then mass could collapse into galaxies much quicker. Yeah, you know, it's it's exactly right. What the microwave background results from these amazing satellites like Planck and WMAP and so on have shown, and even earlier from COBE, you know, there's structure extremely early times in the universe. And so that structure is enough to result in dark matter and gas collapsing together and initiating the growth of galaxies and the first stars. So there's a lot of details there. This is something that Webb does not look back into those times in detail, but we have these other facilities that have really mapped that out and given us a sense that, you know, this is what this could happen and does happen that basically these fluctuations are there that enable the growth of galaxies. Mm. Okay, why don't we take one more? April. Yeah, so Shridhar um, asks, if there appear to be too many bright galaxies that are thought to be 200 to 500 million years old, maybe, <laughs> what is the likely cause of this wrong conclusion if we think Big Bang Theory is solid? Um, personally, I think that the first things to explore are the nature of the stars in these galaxies. You know, they may be bright, not because they're very massive like galaxies now or at a little later time, but very bright because the stars themselves are unusually bright and fewer of them. So there's not a lot of mass in the stars, but there's a lot of light coming from these very early stars. So that, you know, is one of the things that might explain what we're seeing there. So, and the numbers are still relatively small. You know, one doesn't want to leap too far into sort of, you know, exotic approaches when you have small number statistics, it's suggestive. But I would also, you know, astronomers, science goes on this principle that, you know, you try and take the simplest approach forward. Occam's razor, it's often referred to. So if you have a number of competing thoughts, you don't go to the most exotic or the most dramatic one. You try and find the simplest one. And if you eliminate that, then you go to the next one. And this incremental approach sort of may be a little boring at times, but it stands one in good stead and you're more likely to get to a reasonable place by working that way. Mm. Well, I think this is a great place to stop. Thank you. This is a, we'll, we'll leave it with an, with an open question. Uh, <laughs> everyone, please join me in applause for Professor Garth Ellingsworth. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for taking the time. And I hope Web continues to uh, excite us all. <laughs> and I'm sure it will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing your research. It was truly fascinating. And just, I mean, the science is amazing and the politics is amazing and the finance is amazing. Um, uh, just a note for everybody, if you are interested in supporting the work of, of the observatory, of, of Mount Hamilton, of JWST, of Future Telescopes, we encourage you to make a gift. Uh, so we're dropping a contribution link into the chat box right now. Thank you, Diana. Um, I also want to thank the audience. Uh, thank you for your amazing questions. I, uh, I wish we could get to them all. We always get more questions than we can answer. But uh, you know, thanks for your upvotes. Thanks for helping us work through those. And thanks for all the amazing questions. Um, and finally, thanks to the staff, uh, staff of the Alumni Relations and Special Events offices who organized this webinar with us. Thank you, Shana, Diana, Paulina, and Kristen. Um, and also hi and thanks to David, our, our other co third co-organizer who wasn't with us tonight. Our next Slugs and Steins will be Monday evening, June 12th. And it's addressing the question, how do we test self-driving cars and how do we explain their failures? Autonomous systems are prone to errors and failures uh, without explanation, uh, does does the prospect of driverless cars and perhaps large driverless trucks on the roads leave you a little bit on edge? Tune into our talk uh, as Professor Leilani Gilpin from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering guides you through a framework for testing autonomous vehicle systems as well as uh, remaining challenges. Her research focuses on the design and analysis of methods for autonomous systems to explain themselves. Her work has applications to robust decision-making, system debugging, and accountability. Leilani holds a PhD in computer science from MIT, an MS in computational and mathematical engineering from Stanford, and a BS in mathematics and computer science from UC San Diego. 
Meanwhile, UCSA, UCSC has other exciting talks. On the evening of May 11th, the 56th annual faculty research lecture will honor distinguished professor JJ Garcina, Garcia Luna Aceves from the computer science department. The talk, which will be held live on campus, will describe how today's availability of vast computing resources allows us to reimagine how the internet could operate if far more machine intelligence were used inside the networks themselves rather than just at the service and clients. Then on May 17th, uh, the CRA lecture series brings a UC Santa Cruz professor of biomolecular engineering, Daniel Kim, to the UC Santa, UCSC Santa Clara campus to describe RNA liquid biopsy technology and how it will help to advance the future of precision health for all. You can find these and other events at events.ucsc.edu. On behalf of UC Santa Cruz Alumni Association, thank you for joining us and please come back on June 12th at 630 for our next virtual event. Good night, everybody.